Hi, welcome to this presentation about stochastic parameterization with neural networks. My name is Dan Kommelin, and I'm presenting joint work with my colleague Wouter Edeling. The background of what I'm about to present is uh, the following problem in uh, multi-skill modeling and simulation of dynamical systems. Uh, consider uh, this coupled system of large-scale degrees of freedom denoted x and small-scale microscopic degrees of freedom denoted y. They're coupled in the following way. It's a set of um, coupled ordinary differential equations which can come, for instance, from uh, discretizing a partial differential equation. The two sets of degrees of freedom are coupled, as you can see. Um, the x degrees of freedom enter here in the equation for the y degrees of freedom. And the coupling back from the small scales to the large scales goes through this quantity sigma. So that represents the micro to macro coupling or feedback. The motivating example that I have in mind for this problem um, is um, how to represent or parameterize small-scale processes in atmosphere or ocean modeling. So this is one example where you see uh, on the right a satellite picture and on the left uh, a, a modeling uh, snapshots from uh, a large-scale model, uh, background shown in purple, within which uh, small-scale models are nested that can resolve uh, atmospheric cloud and convection processes. So the physics of, of this uh, aren't, aren't very, very relevant for this talk. Uh, the main thing to say here is that how to represent these small-scale processes is a very important and open problem in atmospheric modeling. So back to uh, the more abstract setting that I started out with. I'm going to focus uh, in this talk on uh, the case where the, um, the feedback sigma that I showed before has, uh, has an additive form. So this the function here, that's sort of the, the, the ODE for, for the x degrees of freedom has this form. So the sigma sort of is added to uh, a, essentially an, an autonomous system for, for x only. Uh, moreover, I'm going to focus here on the, on the discrete time version uh, that you can get, for instance, by considering a, a numerical time integration method. Um, for simplicity, I'm assuming a constant time step. Uh, and then we get the following system, where j is now the time index. Um, so it's, it's a mapping, essentially, from time j to time j plus 1 where the x degrees of freedom have a contribution that depends on x only. So that stems, of course, from this small f here. And there is this rj, it's like, almost like a residual, and that comes from effectively from this sigma term here. From that's, that's the feedback term. Um, the y degrees of freedom, uh, there x and y uh, are, are coupled, as you can see here. And, and then the coupling r sub j is effectively, it's a function of y sub j. And, Clearly, because y, the time development of y depends also on x, so indirectly r sub j is also dependent on x. Okay, now the, the dimensionality of this, of this problem, uh, typically uh, the large-scale degrees of freedom and this, uh, this residual or feedback r um, in the setting have the same dimension, and the dimension is much, much lower than uh, the dimensionality, the total numbers of degrees of freedom at the small scales, so the dimension of y. Now, the, the overall aim here is to be able to do long simulations of x, of the macroscopic degrees of, degrees of freedom, without having to resolve the y, because that would result in a major computational speed up. Um, and to be able to do that, uh, we somehow need to parameterize r in terms of x. Because if we just leave out this y equation, then of course this is not a closed system because we need to come up with a way to, uh, to do the time stepping for r without resolving y. So that's the challenge of parameterizing r in terms of x. Okay, now what the focus here is on um, updating, so evolving in time, um, this feedback quantity r by random sampling from this conditional distribution. 
So given the current state and the history of both R and X, we have a distribution for R at the next time step and we sample from that. We randomly sample from this conditional distribution and of course we do that then in tandem with the time stepping or updating of X according to this mapping here, to this rule here. Right, so there's time step of X, it gets us the XJ plus one. Uh, after that, there's the time step of R. We get the update of R, then we go back to the time step of X and so on. So it's in, it's in tandem. And by the sampling from, random sampling from this conditional distribution, effectively we're, we're, we're doing a stochastic parameterization of R with memory, right? There's memory dependence, history dependence. Um, and moreover, because we sample randomly from this distribution rather than go, for instance, for the, uh, for the average, um, it's a, it's a stochastic update, right? So it's a stochastic parameterization with memory and that, so the, the, the theoretical motivation for that um, comes from the Mori transit theory, which I will not discuss here. Uh, there are all kinds of other talks um, where, this is, where this is done um, and some references in the paper on the work that I'm presenting here. So I refer you to that for the Mori transit theory. Okay, now the distrib this conditional distribution is, is unknown in general. Um, that is not a problem for what we're trying to do here because we don't want to know necessarily this distribution. We merely want to be able to sample from it. So how can we sample from it? Well, the, the approach that we're pursuing is a data-driven one. Uh, we're going to assume that we have observations of X and R over a whole bunch of time steps. So I'm denoting them with a superscript O. So X, O, and R, O are the observations. And they come from, for instance, uh, high-resolution simulations where Y is in fact resolved. Um, high-resolution simulations that are limited in space or in time because it would be too expensive to, uh, to do that in, uh, over a long time interval or a large spatial domain. Another possibility is that these data come from, um, from actual physical measurements that would typically be X only measurements, but then we can use this um, almost identity for, for R um, to, to get the R observations if we have the X observations. Okay, now what can we do with these observations? Well, we can use resampling we resample observations to approximate the sampling from this conditional distribution that I showed on the previous slide. So if you do that, what, what does that look like in the reduced model? Well, we have a reduced model here for, for X and R. I'm, I'm using the degrees of freedom with the tilde above it, so the X tilde here and the R tilde here, to distinguish it from the X and the R that's that come from the from the full fully resolved model, including y. So the, the, the tilde degrees of freedom here are for the reduced model. So we have um, the expression for x that we already had. So there's a capital F that depends on x tilde only, and we have the contribution from the from the feedback, the r tilde here. And um, as I mentioned, to time step that we're going to right, so r to get the next update at time j plus one for r tilde, we're going to sample randomly from the set of all observations whose feature vector is close to um, the feature vector that we see in the reduced model. Right, so the feature vectors are, are defined here. Uh, the feature vector in the, so the reduced model space is just a collection of the current and past states and so the recent history of states for both R tilde and X tilde. Um, and the feature vector here is in the observation space and that um, includes the, the, the recent history of R and X in the observations. Right? And they go back um, a number of time steps up to capital J for simplicity. Uh, I'm assuming that the, the memory depth J is the same in both um, for both X and for um, and for R, right, of course, it's, it's easy to, to adapt that. But for simplicity, I'm assuming the same memory depth for both. 
So to get, go back to, to here, um, if these feature vectors are close, right, the corresponding observed R at the next time step right, is going into the set, this S J plus one, from which we're going to sample the next R tilde. And, and this kind of uh, resampling um, is, is, is similar in, in, in construction to um, what's known as the local Markovian bootstrap that uh, uh, was proposed in a paper by uh, Paparoditis and Politis uh, quite some time ago. And even longer ago, it's the idea of K nearest neighbor resampling that's been proposed in, uh, in the context of, of um, um, hydrological modeling uh, by um, Law and Sharma in the, in the 1990s. In those papers, so the, the local carbon bootstrapping and the KNN resampling, there's no coupling back to, to, a, to this model for X, right? It's, it's only about resampling. So what's, what's new here is that we're using resampling in combination with this reduced model for, for X. Okay, now it, it sounds a bit vague maybe. Uh, D tilde is close to DO, right? So these feature vectors, close to each other, what does that mean uh, more concretely? So one way you can think about this is by defining a norm, picking a norm and a, and a threshold epsilon, and then say, okay, um, they're close if this norm, the difference uh, is, um, is below the threshold. Now the drawback of that, that it is slow, because this is something you'd have to, to verify uh, for all the case or in the in the observation uh, data sets, and you have to do that at every time step of the reduced model. So it gets, can get very slow. To be quicker, to speed that up, uh, one possibility is to, to use binning. Uh, so you can bin these feature vectors, uh, and then if they are in the same bin, then you say, okay, they're, they're close to each other. Now that is something you can do, um, provided that um, the number of degrees of freedom in the feature vector isn't very large. Right? Because otherwise you get cursal dimension. If the dimension of X and R is, is denoted N, um, then the dimensionality of the feature vector is, is this, 2NJ plus 2N. So that uh, becomes rapidly too large to, to, to do binning on. However, with small J and N, it's possible to get good results, in fact, very good results with this. And these are two papers uh, from a couple of years ago where we, uh, where we show this. Um, now, the alternative that that's, uh, is, is central to what I'm presenting here is um, actually to do binning, not of, of, the, of the feature vectors, but of the, say, the outputs of the R quantities and then to train a neural net to get a mapping from the space of the feature vectors to, uh, to the bins. Right? And that's a, essentially a problem of uh, probabilistic classification. Right? So th the rest of my talk is going to be about this approach to, uh, to do resampling in the context of, uh, of, of parentization. Right? And Details of it can be found in this paper, which I'll show also at, at the end. Okay, so how does how does that work? So we're going to, to, to bin the, the outputs. Um, I'll say in a little bit why I call it outputs. Uh, so we have the space of observations, right? These, these R sub J O. Um, and we're going to discretize the space in which they live with a number of non-overlapping subsets, which we'll call bins. It's these B sub N objects. So that means that at every time step J, um, the observed R uh, is right, somewhere in one of these bins. And the idea is to train a neural net to map the feature vector to a discrete probability distribution over these bins. And so we want a neural net that um, can essentially approximate this distribution. So given the feature vector, 
what is the probability that the next r, like at the next time step, I mean, at j plus 1, is going to be in the mth bin. So that is going to be the mth elements in this sort of vector valued uh, quantity rho, which is a discrete probability distribution. So that's, that's a, a, as I said, a probabilistic classification problem that we're going to tackle with a quantized softmax network. So more details about that in, the, in, the, in a little bit. Um, so how does that work in, in, uh, when we use this in a reduced model? So again, to, what's needed is to generate r at the next time, r tilde at the next time step, j plus 1, given the feature vector d tilde sub j. So that goes in three steps. First of all, given, right, once the neural net is trained for this, given the feature vector at time j, we feed it to the neural net and out we get this discrete probability distribution that I denote rho here. And so that's a, that's a vector valued quantity. Um, according to this distribution rho, we're going to sample randomly one of uh, one element from this uh, set here, which are the bin indices. Right? So the, the, the bin index runs from one to capital M. So we're going to select one of them, right? Ran sample randomly one of them according to this distribution row. When we have that M, the small M, then we're going to look at all the observations that are in this bin, and we're going to sample one of them randomly and take that as the next R tilde. Now these last two steps can in fact be combined. Um, you can see this as a weighted sampling for all the observed Rs with the following weights. Right, so it's a summation over all the bins, M, um, one over this quantity here, which is the number of observations in the Mth bin. Um, Rho M is the, uh, the element from the discrete probability di distribution that comes from this, this step one. And then this is the indicator function uh, with arguments um, are observed in the mth bin. Right, and to go back to this one here, so B sub M is um, the number of observations RO that are in this bin. And here the summation is over the entire time length of the, uh, of the observation set. I want to emphasize that what, what's happening here, so this, this resampling with, uh, with the neural net is fundamentally different from giving a direct neural network based prediction of R tilde at j plus one from the feature vector uh, with time in xj. Right, because in the, a, a direct prediction, you, you feed it the same feature vector twice, you get in principle back the same R tilde. Uh, what we do here is, is map the feature vector to a probability distribution over the bins and use that to do the resampling of, of R tilde. Okay, so we use a quantized softmax network, QSN, um, for this probabilistic classification. So that's a network with uh, the feature vector as input, right? So that's, uh, these are in principle, it's, it's, it's a vector of size 2nj plus 2n with all uh, real valued quantities. That's the input and then the outputs, right? And that is why I was referring to R as outputs uh, earlier on. Um, the output of this QSN is uh, a probability mass function, right, where um, all the elements um, together sum up to one. Okay, now we use a feed four arch architecture with a softmax layer at, uh, at the end, so, so different architectures um, may also be possible. Um, right, there's some flexibility there. The main thing here is to use the softmax layer at the end to, right, to produce this discrete probability distribution. Okay, and the training, I'm not going to say much here, so we use a cross entropy loss function for that.
I'm just showing you the, uh, the architecture in case the, the dimensionality of X and R is one. And so we have a, a feature vector. We use two hidden layers here and here. Uh, it produces an output um, H from one to capital M. That's what you see here. And from that, so we apply the softmax layer, which turns this H into uh, the probability distribution in this way. Now, if you have um, X and R that are uh, not scalars, but vector valued, um, it's possible to get a, a scaling of the QSN input and output that's linear in, in N by using uh, sort of separate distributions for the separate elements of, of RJ. Right, here's an example. Um, architecture that you get with n equals two right so there's this this h out so first we had one of these one such set right in the previous figure now we have two such sets because n equals two um, and then we apply again the softmax layer and then we get effectively two discrete distributions one for the first element of r and one for the second element of r and in the paper we discuss other ways to to deal with um, the case where n is is larger than one, in fact, can be fairly large. So this is this is one way to uh, to go about this. Okay, I am going to show some results from uh, from a test case um, that we use to um, um, to experiment with this. This is with this type of resampling stochastic parameterization. It's the, uh, the well-known Lorenz 96 model, the two-layer L96 model consisting of a set of a couple of nonlinear ODEs. It's one of the models from, from Ed Lorenz that he uh, proposed in 1996. So as I said, it's, it's been, uh, it, it's, the model's been used a lot for, for uh, parameterization studies. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it here in detail. Again, I refer to the paper by Lorenz or Lorenz Waller paper. We also discuss it in, uh, in some detail in our paper, which I'll show at the end. So there you can find the details. And what I want to say here is that we consider in our test two parameter settings for this two-layer Lorenz 96 model. One is what we call the unimodal setting. Right? So it's a set of parameters that's very frequently used. Um, and it results in unimodal probability distributions for the model, the X model variables. On top of that, we consider a setting of the parameters that we call the bimodal setting, which is a, a non-standard, but it's also more challenging uh, for parentization. Right? In the unimodal setting, um, in my experience, use this model uh, on other occasions as well, also in the context of parentization. In the unimodal setting, it's, um, it's not too difficult to get pretty good results. Uh, I think this bimodal setting is, uh, is a lot more challenging um, and gives some interesting insight in how well a particular parameterization scheme works. So we we try this, um, we use this, this bimodal setting uh, as well here. And in both settings, the dimension, the dimensionality of X and R is, uh, is 18. And uh, the total number of the Y degrees of freedom is, uh, is 360. And for those of you who are familiar with the Renz model, so that means that every X degree of freedom is associated with 20 y degrees of freedom. Again, I refer you to the paper for, uh, for more details on this. Okay, in this figure, I show the, the, the given impression of the, the quality of the, um, uh, of the training of the, of the, of the QSN. 
the, uh, these two figures on the, uh, the horizontal and the vertical axis are two elements of the feature vector. It is in fact a two-dimensional feature vector that we consider here. And the color shows you the, the bin index. Right, so and on the left, um, you see the bin index in the observation data. And then on the right, um, it is the, the most probable bin index that is uh, predicted by the, by the network, by the quantized softmax network. Right, and you see here from, from, from the colors and the, and the figures that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good match. Okay, now that's of course, that was only the, the, the distribution for the, for the bin index. So how does it go if we really couple it to the reduced model? Um, so here you see on the left, um, the long-term probability distribution of one of the X degrees of freedom of the L96 model. And on the right, you see the distribution of this R quantity both for the full model, that's with the, with the little pluses here, and also what is produced with the reduced model with this QSN resampling parentization, right? So that's these blue lines. And you see in this case, so this is the, the unimodal setting, so you see unimodal distribution for, for X here. Um, and this gives a very good result. It's a very close match, right? And, and in the paper, we also have figures to show the, um, Time correlation functions and there in the match matches also very very close. And then the feature vector that we used here is in fact consists only of these two elements. So it's it's x at uh, current time step j and at a number of time steps back, right? Nine time steps back. Right? It's a two-dimensional feature vector in this case. So again, a close match for this unimodal setting. So let's see how things go with the with the, um, bimodal setting, as I mentioned, that's more challenging. And that also uh, shows in this case. So here again, the, the PDFs of X and R, both for the full model and for the, uh, the reduced model. So what you see here, so this is the bimodal setting indeed for, for X, you see two clear peaks in the, uh, uh, in the invariant distribution right, obtained from, from long time integrations. And with the feature vector that we used here, which is uh, in fact more extensive than in the previous case. So here it's xj all the way down to xj minus one. So it's 10 elements in total, 10 times 10 steps back. Uh, in spite of that, the result is not good at all. Right, so the, again, the pluses are uh, the result for the full model. And what you see here is that the reduced model with this resampling, QSN resampling, parentization, does a poor job um, when you compare the, uh, the long-term distribution of X um, of this reduced model with, with the full model. Right? It doesn't capture the, the, the right type of the distribution at all. Now, fortunately, what, what's possible with this um, resampling approach and the, um, the QSN, so probabilistic prediction of the, of, the, of the right bin, is that it's, it's not difficult to, um, to consider a much longer, so a much longer feature vector with, with, uh, with many more um, elements in it. Right? So here, this is 10-dimensional, but now I show a result, that's this figure, where we extended this to a 75-dimensional feature vector. Right? So we include a lot more memory in the feature vector now, and again, it's X only here. Um, but all the way going for 75 time steps back. And here you see the result is much, much better, right? So the, the reduced model in blue here, uh, I mean, it's not perfect, but it does capture the overall shape of the distribution that we also see in the full model uh, quite well. And so again, this is the only difference between what I show here and what I show here is the length of the feature vector, right? The way we've set this up now makes it fairly easy to consider much longer feature vectors. And that's, that's very beneficial in this case, as you can see. Okay, that brings me to the, to the end of this presentation. 
Um, so I've, I've presented a way to use machine learning for stochastic parameterization of small scales. And there's there's a, a, a lot of recent work on using machine learning for deterministic parameterization of small scales. Uh, the use of uh, machine learning for stochastic parameterization is, 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 um, is much less explored. Um, I present an approach with resampling using quantized softmax network for uh, probabilistic classification. So that's, that's one approach. I should mention there is uh, an alternative approach that, that's being pursued in, a, in just a few very recent papers using um, uh, generative adversarial nets, for instance, in this recent paper by Ganya et al. So that's a very different approach where you have to train GANs. Um, what we train here is, is a network for, for classification, which is something of a classical problem in, in machine learning and um, lends itself well to, um, um, to learning. It's, it's a fairly straightforward problem uh, as far as the machine learning side is concerned. Okay, I, I've discussed the, uh, the way that we can include memory dependence um, through this feature vector and the way that we can use the feature vector to, to enlarge the, 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 the length of the, of, the, of, the, of the memory. And finally, um, something I haven't mentioned yet, the fact that we use resampling, right? so we only use in our reduced model these R quantities that we have in the observations. Right? So and that gives us a certain degree of physical consistency, right? Because these are observations that right? come from either high resolution model or maybe even from, from actual physical measurements. So those are our observations that are consistent with either right, a realistic complex model or even with the uh, with real world observations, right? So that, that physical consistency is, is something that's um, that's not completely trivial. If you uh, generate your R's in a different way, um, you may end up with um, with feedback um, fields or values or so R's that that's that are just inconsistent, right? So this resampling um, is, um, is 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 less vulnerable to that uh, potential problem. Okay, I'm going to leave it at this, uh, just show the slides uh, in the organizations that have supported this work. And finally, the various uh, papers that I mentioned are all listed here. Uh, and again, the uh, most of what I presented come from the paper that's here at the, at the top uh, with Lauter Edelin. Um, that's on, on archive, and here you can find the, the precise number. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thanks for listening. And I'm going to stop the recording.